that really in the Bible? You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, hello, I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? I want to ask you a question. Why do you go to church? Now, maybe you never thought about it, and maybe the thought has never crossed your mind. You just do it because everybody else is doing it, or maybe not everybody else is doing it, but your family and your parents before you or whatever, they went to church, and so you just do it because the culture is doing it, it's society is doing it, and you just feel like, well, it's, it's probably the right thing to do is to get me some religion and go to church. But maybe you've never asked the question or thought about, or maybe you can't even answer the question. Chances are you cannot honestly answer the question, why do you go to church? I'll never forget one time I was at Bojangles and across the road was a mega church. And in this mega church, there, were, there was this, um, this, this nice dressed woman stepped out of a vehicle with her husband. He had cowboy boots, cowboy hat, and he, he was sort of, his demeanor, he was sort of walking along like this with his head down. She had him by the ear like this. And no, just kidding, but, but she needed to. And his whole demeanor said, I don't want to be here. I would rather be anywhere besides going to church. I mean, he looked like he needed to be roping, roping cattle or something like that or on a you know, a cattle run or something like that, riding horses, but, you know, anywhere but church. And it was just a powerful image of, and it really stirred up, you know, the question, why do people go to church? But the question I'm asking you is, why do you go to church? I want to read you a poem. It's a, my mother, before she passed away, she gave us all a poem book and, uh, I like this little story here. It says, some go to church just for the walk. Some go to laugh and some go to talk. Yeah, you got a lot of those in, there, in church. Some go there for uh, speculations while some go there for observation. Some go there to meet a lover. Yes, that's true. Some, the pulse, to go there to discover. Some go there to meet a friend. Some go there tedious time to spend. Some go there to doze and nod. Yes, you've, you, the land of nod. You know, that, that should, should be, that'd be a good name for a church, the land of nod. Uh, but few go there to worship God. Few go there to worship God. Now, when you think of worship, what comes to mind? Well, I tell you, for a lot of people, what comes to mind when they think of worshiping God, they think a lot of song and dance and praise music and just, you know, maybe really just having a, a wonderful time, maybe almost like a concert type of, of worship service. And somewhere sandwiched in between all of that song and dance may be a 15-minute message. And they may or may not quote the Bible in that 15-minute message. But I think a lot of people, when they think of worship, that's basically what they think of. They think of a short little feel good, you know, lift myself up by my bootstraps, motivational type of speaking, where they go there and they're made to feel good about themselves. They're, they, 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 they're told you're saved, sanctified, and heaven bound, and that's, that's it, you know. That's what they think about when, when they think of worship. But 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1 and, and Paul is talking to a, an elderly man, was talking to a much younger minister, Timothy. And he says this, he says, Therefore, I solemnly, solemnly, excuse me, witness before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to judge the living at the, and the dead according to his appearance and his kingdom. In other words, Christ is going to return to this earth. And he is going to judge the living and the dead. In other words, the dead is going to be resurrected. But he's going to judge them both. So you better get 
your concept of what it means to worship, to truly worship God, you better know what it is. He continues on in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, preach the word. And this is what Paul is telling this younger minister, Timothy, preach the word. Okay, we go to church to hear preaching, right? Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, here's the problem. There's one word and only one word in there that we like, and that is the word exhort, exhortation. And that's why people seem to go to church to be lifted up, to be inspired, to be encouraged, to be told they're right with the Lord. Exhortation is the one word that they sort of like. But, but notice there's other words here. And this is all a part of the worship of God. It says to reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, when was the last time you heard your church's doctrines on any stance that you want to talk about, on any subject that you want to talk about. I want, you, I want to challenge you. I want you to go to your minister and tell and ask him and say, I want to see our church's doctrines of statements and beliefs, what we believe. I want to see our doctrine on, let's say, Sunday keeping, why we go to church on Sunday. And I want to see all the scriptures that tell us why we should be worshiping on the first work day of the week. I want to see our church's doctrine on the celebration of Christmas and how that we claim it's all about Jesus. But why, why in the middle of winter, December 25th, and why do we do what we do at Christmas? Is it really all about Jesus? I want to see our doctrines on where this is commanded in the Bible. I want to see our doctrines on heavenly retirement, where Jesus taught that when you die, you retire as a Christian. I want to see all the scriptures that pertain to that concept, okay? I want to see our doctrines on the teaching of the immortality of the soul. All the scriptures, you know, in other words, go to your men. I challenge you. Your church may not even have a set of doctrines, statements, and beliefs. May not even have it. And you see, this is the part of worship. If you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, this scripture tells us at church, I want you to, part of worship is to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Okay? You need to be here. If you don't know why you're doing what you do, or if you can't prove what you're, why you do what you do, you're, you're a baloney Christian is what you are. You're, 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 there's nothing, there's, you're not authentic. You're not real if you can't prove why you, from the Bible, why you do what you do. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind. God never sent, I'm asking the question, why are you going to church? God never sent an Old Testament prophet to Israel to tell them how good they were living. He never, ever, ever sent a prophet to Israel to tell them how good they... Now, think about that. Think about that. You mean there was never? and it, You people are living so well. I'm so impressed with how you're living your life. Think about that in relationship as to why you go, go to church. What is your motivation? What are you getting at church? I've just told you that God never sent an Old Testament prophet to Israel to tell them how good they were living. So what's motivating you to go to church? What are you getting at church? What are you hearing at church that motivates you and drives you to continue to go there? Are you getting reproof, rebuke, correction? No, you're not. You're not, okay? Now, let's take a look at the messages to the churches. What church? Any church. It's in the book of Revelation where there are seven churches. Now, people, people look at this a different way. Some people say this is church eras, but I just apply it. Well, let's take a look at the scripture and, and you'll, you'll see what I'm saying. At Revelation 2 and verse 7, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Now, I want you to do something. I want you to reach up here, grab, grab this ear. 
Now, grab your other ear. Now, what do you have? Chances are you got two ears. You don't even need two. If you got one, that's good enough. Okay, now what's this verse saying? It says, if you have an ear, right here, hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. What churches? Take your pick. Take all of them, okay? Take your pick. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So let's take a look at these seven churches in the book of Revelation and see what kind of great encouragement God gave to these seven churches. The first one is Church of Ephesus. And this was the church that had forsaken its first love. Okay, that's not good. All right. Uh, Smyrna, second church, the church that would suffer persecution. Well, that's not good either uh, when you think about it. Uh, Pergamon, third church, the church that needed to repent. Okay, this is, this is what God is saying. Uh, these seven churches, you know, down through history, and we can apply that to, you know, let, let it, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thyatira, the church that had a false prophetess. Well, boy, you got a lot of those today. Women uh, speaking from the pulpit, false prophetess. Uh, Sardius, the fifth church, the church that had fallen asleep. Philadelphia, the sixth church, the church that had endured patiently. Now, this is probably about the only church where you get some positivity going on. Uh, it wasn't too bad, okay? The church that had endured patiently. The seventh church, the church of Laodicea, the church with the lukewarm faith, okay? God says, look, because you're neither cold or hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, and the spit is drying on the sidewalk, okay? What, I'm, what am I saying? I'm saying, let, if you have an ear, hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches that dot the landscape. It doesn't sound very good. Uh, God does not come to these churches with a message, wonderful job, great job. You're such holy people. I love your praise and worship music. I love how you tell everyone at Christmas that it's all about the birth, um, about, it's all about Jesus, even though I don't believe it. But uh, I love how you do that. I love how you put Halloween in church because... You know, you just had such rotten neighbors that you had to you had to get the kids off the street because of all your your perverted neighbors that you lived around. Uh, I just love how you teach a no law theology that the law has been abolished, been nailed on the cross, has been fulfilled. I just love how you have made salvation the death of my son, who suffered, bled, and died an excruciating death, so easy. All, you know, all heads bowed. Now, if you accept Jesus into your heart, just raise your hand. I just love how you've done that. I love how you have a, you know, maybe a Sunday worship, 45 minutes, and then it's out the door, back to business as usual. I just look, you know, so I'm, I, no, God doesn't come to these churches with a, a message of encouragement. He has correction for each church. So I'm asking, what are you getting at church and why do you go to church? Again, God never sent an Old Testament prophet to Israel to tell them how good they were living. You must be getting something out of church. In fact, you must be getting the exact opposite at church. You must be getting, you know, instead of correction, rebuke, and instruction and doctrine, you must be getting... I feel good theology. You know, there's, there's nothing you must do. I mean, you're saved, sanctified, and heaven bound, and, and God just wants to bless you. He just wants to give you that three car garage and send me your seed donation. You know, you give me your money, and somehow you'll get wealthier, which doesn't make a bit of sense, by the way. Never have figured that one out. You know, why people can't put two and two together and figure that one out, what it equals. But um, anyway. So why, I'm asking the question, why do you go to church? Now let's consider something Jesus said in Luke 14, Luke 11 and verse 49. Therefore are also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets 
which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. Why? And let me tell you something. They hated the messenger boy. They hated the messenger boy because the messenger boy came with a message that was not the kind of message they were expecting. There came a day when Jesus wept over Jerusalem. This is found in Luke 13, verse 34. He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets and stones them that are sent unto thee. Notice this. Notice what you do. You stone, I send you prophets and you kill them. How often I would have gathered thy children together as a hen does gather her brood under her wings, but you would not have it. Are we any different? Are we any, any different? Now, maybe we don't kill the messenger, boy. We just choose another church that makes us feel good. We don't kill the prophets. We just choose a church that has no truth. You know, and if that describes you, if you're one of these pea brain people that just go from, you get offended at every church you go to, and you just keep choosing churches because you, someone offended you, so someone said something that you didn't like, you are a pathetic loser if that describes you. You know, you just get out of the religious business. Just can your relationship with God. You don't need it anyway. It's not doing you any good. Listen, if Jesus Christ came to your church and preached his word and explained to you what he expects from you, how to live your life, what to cut out, what to add, if Jesus Christ came to your church with an explanation of each one of the Ten Commandments and how we are lacking in those areas, he would be killed all over again. Listen, it was the religious people that killed Jesus Christ in the first place. The religious people killed him, okay? And he would be killed all over if he came to your church preaching the truth. So I'm asking you a question. Why do you go to church? Isaiah 30 and verse 9. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. You know, with this recent midterm election, they kept talking about it's going to be a red wave. It's going to be a red wave on the Republican side. On their ticket was inflation, border control, crime, and education. On the Democrat side, it was abortion. Yeah, and abortion has become like a god, small letter G, to these people. We must be able to kill the innocent, unborn children. We, we, we got to be able to murder those things if we don't want them, okay? Uh, so abortion was on their ticket. Democracy, you know, right before the, the midterm election wound down, Obama went out there talking about democracy. He didn't know what he was talking about, but he was talking about it anyway. And on the ticket was gender rights. Gender, and there was no red Wave. Now think about this. Think about the two sides. Okay. Republican, inflation, border control, crime, education. Democrat side, abortion, democracy, and gender rights. What is gender rights? That means if you're a man and you got a penis and you're, you think you're a woman, you got rights. Yeah, I admit you got a right to get your head examined, but other than that, I don't know what kind of rights you have. And there was no red wave. The people got what they wanted. The president was asked with his low approval rating what he was going to change. He said nothing. Business as usual. So who do we blame? Who do we blame for the mess that we are in as a nation? Let's start with the church. Let's start with asking a question. Why do you even go to church? Isaiah 30 and verse 9. I'm going to keep repeating this until you get it. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceit. I like the way this is written in the uh, God's Word translation. They say to the seers, don't see the future. They say... To those who have visions, don't have visions that tell us what is right. Tell us what we want 
to hear C, illusions. Yeah, we want to go to a smoke. We want to go to a church that has smoke and mirrors and, and that will show us and tell us illusions. Let me tell you what you should be hearing at church. This is what you need to be hearing in church. This nation, America, is headed downhill like a snowball headed toward hell. Our religion is vain. That's what you need to be hearing in church, and you're not going to hear it from the pulpit. Our religion is vain. It's not getting the results that we should be getting, okay? Wouldn't you think that, that, if, that if our religion was working, we should be able to change a nation? Isn't that what religion is all about to begin with? Changing the man or woman in the mirror? Making this world a better place? It's not working, okay? Now, would God ever tell us to quit going to church? Question. Would God ever tell, would God ever get fed up with our religion? Isaiah 1 verse 13. I'm reading from the Message Bible. It says, quit your worship charades. I can't stand your trivial religious games. Monthly conferences, weekly Sabbath, special meetings, meetings, meetings. I can't stand one more. Meetings for this, meetings for that. I hate them. You worn me out with your religion. I'm sick of your religion, 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 while you go right on sinning. Now, let's focus on this while you go right on sinning. Now, I admit churches are full of sinners, but they don't know what sin is. Do you know what sin is? Chances are you don't. What, tell me the biblical definition of sin, what the Bible defines as sin. 1 John 3, 4, sin is a transgression of the law. The problem is a lot of people going to church don't know that they are sinners. They're basically looking at themselves, look, I'm good, I'm okay, I'm right with the Lord, I'm saved, sanctified, heaven bound. You don't need to talk to me, I'm okay. Revelation 2 and verse 7, he that has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, notice that, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2 and verse 11. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh, notice that, overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Revelation 2 and verse 17. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, save he that receives it. Now, did you notice this? This is strange. The way you get access to the tree of life, the way you avoid the second death, the way we receive a new name is by being an overcomer. What is an overcomer? It's a winner. God's not going to spend eternity with a pack of losers. Now, what do you need to overcome? What sin? What addiction? What perversion? There's a monster inside of all of us, and all you got to do is just feed it the wrong kind of stuff for it to become a full-blown monster. We have been become so desensitized. We have numbed ourselves out. We don't even feel the need to change. And if some come, one comes along and corrects you, you hate him for it. Church has desensitized us to the issue of sin. One reason you don't hear about it. You don't hear about sin. Now, what is the role of the church? Is it just a social club? Is it just a place where you hang out with friends? Or is it just a place where you're made to feel good about yourself? What is the role of the church? 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, let's answer that question. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And I'm telling you, people go to church and they say, I have no need for doctrine. I have no need for reproof. I, have, I can't tolerate correction. I have no need for instruction. I wouldn't listen to them anyway. My question is, why are you going to church? The role of the church is for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let me tell you the reason you go to church. It's because you're in the echo chamber. It's the sound of your own voice coming back to you. It's what you want to hear. You've already determined before you walk through the door what you want to hear. And if you don't hear it, you'll find another church. 
And again, if that describes you, you are a pathetic joke. God never sent an Old Testament prophet to Israel to tell them how good they are living. So my question is, why are you going to church? Do we really go to church to worship God? Do we even understand what it means to worship God? Let me tell you what it means to worship God. You go to church for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for rebuke, for doctrine. And you go there for exhortation, to be exhorted. But most people just go there to feel good about themselves and to be exhorted. And all these other things that includes worship, reproof, correction, instruction, in righteousness, rebuke, and doctrine, they don't go there for that. I'm David Freeman, and I've just told you what's really in your Bible. We need to repent. We need to be quit becoming desensitized by our churches. And we need to get to a point where our religion is real, not just an act in futility of dressing up and going to church. I'll see you next time. This nation needs to repent. But repent of what? What is sin? Few people, in fact, few religious people, understand the definition of sin. As a nation, we need not only to repent, but we need to have the experience of repentance. Your religion is not enough. Too much confidence in religion can be the downfall of a nation. What is real religion? What is real repentance? Order by writing to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Also, check us out on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.com. If you would like more information or if you have any questions, write to Is That Really in the Bible? 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Or visit us on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.net. For more information, check us out online at isthatreallyinthebible.net. Listen to the podcast, watch the weekly program, worship with us on our weekly Sabbath service, and be sure to visit our free bookstore. Again, the website is isthatreallyinthebible.net. This program has been paid for by the tithes and offerings of the Church of God Rocky Mount and friends of this ministry. If you have been challenged by listening to this program, then consider that a great blessing. You can visit us on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.net. It is the support of people like you that make this ministry possible. If you have been blessed by this understanding given to you today, then consider making a donation by writing to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151.